Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, hello, and thank you for attending today. My name is Kaylin, and I'm supporting today's webinar. Just a few notes about our meeting format. Um, if you would like to send a message to everyone in the meeting, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We will also post links and responses in the chat as we go, so be on the lookout for those. If you would like to send a question to the meeting host and panelists only, you have the option of doing that in the Q&A button. The raise hand tool can also be used if you would like to be unmuted so that you can speak to the group. Finally, just a note that this session will be recorded. We are very interested in your input today, and hopefully these tools will allow everyone to communicate with the group smoothly. With that, I'll hand it off to Christine. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Christine Mayu, and I'm a principal analyst with CTC Technology and Energy. We're a consulting firm that's working with the Wyoming Business Council um, to take them on this uh, broadband planning journey. Um, we are a relatively small group today, so I thought we would actually just take a minute right now to go around and introduce everybody that's on the phone. Um, so if it's okay, I'll start with Kylie Ingersoll, and um, we'll go from there. Thank you, Christine. Um, my name is Kylie Ingersoll. I'm the Southwest Regional Director for the Wyoming Business Council, and I cover Lincoln, UN, and Sweetwater County, and um, I'm just here as support. Okay. David? Yeah, David Johnson. I am working for the Wyoming Business Council as a consultant to help with the BEAD and the ARPA Capital Projects Funds. Great. So why don't we have the attendees, if you guys, um, I think it looks like you're unmuted. Um, we'll we'll um, unmute you to introduce yourselves. Um, so uh, Tracy, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll call you out. You want to go first? Yep, I am Tracy Morris from the Powell Economic Development Partnership in Powell, Wyoming. Great, thanks. Jason? Uh, yeah, Jason Hendricks uh, with Range. We're a broadband provider. Great, and uh, Devin? Hello, my name is Devin Costa Cargill. I'm the Regional Director for the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming Small Business Development Center. All right. Well, great. Well, welcome, everybody. We're so glad to have you. Um, so today we will be um, talking about the bead and digital access uh, stakeholder sessions that we're having today. We're going to talk a little bit about the Wyoming Business Council's planning process for the bead program and the digital access program that um, they're in the thick of right now. Um, and actually, we'll go to the agenda slide since we did introductions. Um, so we're going to, at a high level, we're going to be talking about the beat and digital access uh, planning process that the Wyoming Council is doing. Our agenda today has us doing a brief technology overview just so we can level set everybody. A couple of you may have already been actually do a, a few of our previous meetings um, that uh, where this technology overview was also done. So I'll, I'll still go through it. Um, we'll go through it pretty quickly. If you guys have questions, uh, maybe once I've sort of stopped at that section, we'll check and see if anybody has questions. We'll talk about the funding and programmatic opportunities, uh, what the Wyoming Business Council has plans for community engagement, and then we will get into the workforce development specific element of this uh, presentation, talking about the role that workforce development has to play in this process and um, what uh, some data collection and some surveys that we're hoping that uh, folks with expertise and that are working in the workforce development space can fill out to help give us some data to inform our planning process. So that's the goal for today. Um, we'll get started. So we start at the most basic level, and again, many of you may already know this, but you know, I wanted to start out um, with the idea that the I, uh, what is broadband, how is broadband defined, has definitely been evolving over just really a short period of time, just a matter of a decade or so. And um, we start with the FCC's definition, and the FCC's definition of what is broadband is 25 megabits per second download, 3 megabits per second upload. That speed, that criteria, that minimum standard actually finds its way into a lot of different federal regulations, a lot of different federal programs, um, and still exists today. It is the current definition that the FCC is using um, 
although, you know, obviously they're recognizing that it's a little outdated right now, as you'll see in a minute, uh, it's pretty slow speed. There's lots of things that you can't do online these days if that's the total uh, speed access that you have. Um, so therefore we move into what Congress started to look at uh, right around the pandemic when Congress stepped in with a lot of funding programs, a lot of emergency measures. They said, hey, wait a minute, 25-3, way too slow. We're going we're gonna to start using 120 as sort of our rough baseline, our minimum standard for certain things. Um, and so 100 megabit per second download, 20 megabit per second upload tends to be the minimum speed that you have to offer if you're going to use a lot of this funding. Um, and it also, importantly, is one of the criteria when you're looking at a map or you're looking at an area to, to try to determine who is served in the area, who has adequate broadband, and who is unserved or underserved. And 120 now is generally looked at as underserved. If you only have access to anything less than 120, you're generally considered underserved um, by many of, many of the federal program standards. However, we are going to move even farther forward to 100-100, 100 symmetrical, um, because what technology, you know, what we're all finding is that that's really right now, and maybe for not too much longer, the minimum amount of broadband that a lot of um, large families, families of four, people who are working online, people who are doing school online, that's what they need to really have a successful online experience. And so um, or, uh, organizations like the Wyoming Business Council and um, lots of other states, uh, they're standing up their broadband programs. They're looking in that, at that 100, 100 megabit per second speed as the minimum standard for what's, what the services should be offering residential consumers uh, on infrastructure that is funded by these programs. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So you may be wondering, like, how much bandwidth do we need? What is this is all relative, right? It's all in the right context. So where are we now? Um, and so this just, you know, chart is intended to give you a, a rough estimate. Actually, I think it's, you know, slightly conservative in the broadband needs. Um, it's showing you that if you're going to be doing certain telehealth applications, obviously Netflix, Netflix streaming, Alexa and smart devices, as you can see, that blue bar is way over to the 30 megabit per second um, speed requirements, uh, internet surfing. Really what we find is for a family of four, the total evening bandwidth use is, um, excuse me, is you know right around a little less than 40 megabits per second for that family of four. So obviously that 23, 25, three speed we dumped a long time ago, 120 would be okay for now, which is why we consider them just underserved, but we'd really like to see that 100, 100 speed to get some room for growth. The, the chart below it really is kind of looking into the future, perhaps not that far into the future when the applications are gonna demand even more bandwidth going to demand even more speed um, for augmented reality, artificial intelligence, many more smart devices that are going to be constantly asking and pinging outside systems. So what you're really going to need, as you can see from both the blue and the purple, is a pretty equal amount of upload and download speeds. And that's why that 100-100 symmetrical is so important, that there's going to be a lot more uploading of information away from your house in addition to what you might do for Netflix streaming uh, down. So where, where, where do we need all of this speed? What, is, what are we looking at here when we're talking about broadband infrastructure and investing in broadband infrastructure? Um, this is obviously a very high level schematic of what a broadband network might look like. We've chopped it up into three chunks um, that we all sort of consider. One is long haul uh, network. As you can see, it's basically the gray lines going in between larger metropolitan areas, large cities. If we had a bigger screen, if we had more time, we'd show you the entire United States with that long haul network that fills the entire country, uh, even with submarine cables, uh, which would be part of this long haul network, you end up going obviously internationally. And it's really what sends those packets far, far away, what sends that data traffic um, far away and brings the data traffic back home to Wyoming on this long haul network. 
the traffic and it, and as it says it's primarily fiber network it's multiple bundles of fiber depending on where you are the blue circles are what's called the data center where all the traffic is aggregated those data centers um, have multiple providers bringing in their equipment to grab data and send it back out to other places um, then we send it out to a city then the data center in Cheyenne then co congregates all that traffic that's going there for two places in and around Chey in the Cheyenne area. And so then it takes that traffic and puts it on the middle mile network. The middle mile network is also oftentimes fiber, maybe smaller, maybe not quite so many bundles, not quite so many strands of fiber in these thinner gray lines. The middle mile network is really just a pass through. It's taking traffic back and forth from the last mile to the long haul. Um, it's also doing a lot of wireless traffic. Uh, well, wireless providers are using this middle mile to carry a lot of its traffic out. And then the middle mile network does directly connect certain large scale businesses, banks, multi-location businesses, large academic institutions, large government agencies. Um, and so the middle mile um, is a very important part of this. If you don't have middle mile, obviously you see that missing link in the middle and there are federal programs around middle mile infrastructure investment as well. Uh, but today we're primarily discussing last mile, the last, the investment in the last mile infrastructure. And this last mile, as you can see, is the end of the road. Um, it is both wireline and wireless. Sometimes it's fiber, oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it's still the old copper network from the phone company where they were using telegraph lines and burying copper wire under the ground to give you telephone service. Um, and then sometimes it's the cable company and we'll see this in a minute. And then sometimes it's your wireless company. So there's lots of different technology options that can go. But most importantly, it is that network that's in your neighborhood. It's also perhaps in your small business district. Um, and so we are um, really looking to make sure that this last mile infrastructure is capable of those speeds we talked about earlier. So as I mentioned, the last mile network can be made up of several different types of technologies um, and from you know, small area to small area, depending on the phone company's business model and business plans and where they are in their upgrade structure, it could be different. Um, the oldest, um, one of this batch is digital subscriber line. It has been around for a long time. It is still around. A lot of people still get their broadband access through DSL. Um, it uses the old copper network um, and it was the way the phone company figured uh, probably 40 years ago now, I would say they've started to figure out how to use the copper network to provide um, higher speed data um, and video. And then as it's been upgraded and you know improved from there, it still won't get you super fast speeds. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it very much depends on where your house sits along the network and how close you are to where the traffic is aggregated. Um, DSL is definitely being phased out. Most larger phone companies are not selling services over DSL even anymore, even if they haven't upgraded their network. Um, and then upgrade I'm talking about is to the next one, fiber to the premises. Um, fiber to the premises has also actually been around for a long time, somewhat surprisingly, but it hasn't really been thought of as a residential application until relatively recently. And it is what it sounds like. It's getting that high speed, very reliable uh, fiber cable out to each individual household, um, to the curb, essentially, to your house. And um, it's expensive. It, it, is, it can be hard to deploy, which is one reason why it's been around for a long time, but we haven't used it. Um, but that is uh, primarily what we're looking at, um, what we being the most states are looking at as far as the federal funding um, goes to invest in infrastructure. Uh, we're really looking at fiber to the premises in many applications because of the speed, because of the reliability. Um, however, there are many others. There's hybrid fiber coax, which is essentially your cable company network. Every most houses have two pipes into the house. One pipe is the copper line, or now maybe slowly the fiber line to the house. The other pipe is the cable network where you get your cable TV from. Probably, oh, you know, 30 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, the cable companies began to experiment with how to put um, data, voice, traffic on their network and so they could start competing in the data space. And they've successfully done so. Um, they are. Um, 
offering competitive speeds, certainly to DSL over their cable network. Um, they're upgrading their cable network all the time as well, and including putting some fiber into their cable network. So that's where we get the hybrid, hybrid coaxial uh, terminology. The next two are the wireless technologies that we're looking at uh, that can offer relatively high speed um, broadband services. One is mobile wireless, th that's your phone. Um, and um, you know many of you have probably heard 4G, 5G, the G standing for generation. Um, most people, I guess it's safe to say, although, you know, in a place like Wyoming where, where wireless and mobile are probably very uh, complicated in some ways, there may be some 3G out there still, but many still, many have access to 4G and the phone companies are slowly upgrading to 5G, um, you know, uh, depends on the company as far as their time frame goes, but 5G is definitely faster, 5G is definitely more reliable. And uh, no doubt they're working on a 6G. Um, fixed wireless is, as it sounds, um, instead of carrying your phone around and you know having the data follow you, essentially it is your house or a place of business and a tower somewhere nearby that's got a different kind of equipment on it, a different antenna that can then communicate data, voice, um, video traffic to the fixed point of your house. Um, most wa mobile wireless companies are the ones rolling out the fixed wireless, at least on large um, mass market scale, but um, it's still in development. Um, and uh, some places have a pretty robust service offering. Many, many places do not. Um, it doesn't go hand in hand with 5G. They can do fixed wireless over 4G, but uh, for the most part, the, the two service offerings tend to go together. Here's a relatively complicated slide. I think the most important part of this slide to think about is how everything's clustered sort of still today over on the middle to left-hand side of the slide, the slower speeds, the megabit, the 50, 100, uh, 10 uh, megabit per second requirements there. Um, only when you, you know, start to get out to the faster speeds, do you have the fiber to the premises, a uh, early stage uh, upgrade for the cable network, a uh, very early stage upgrade for what's called millimeter wave fixed wireless technologies um, can get you up to that gigabit per second speed right now. Um, obviously things are e evolving and upgrading and changing, but, you know, one of, as you'll hear, one of the Business Council's tasks is to really understand what is available in Wyoming today. And so while these companies may have all these great upgrade plans, um, we really want to understand what people can access today. And this is close, um, certainly the darker bars um, in, in most areas. Um, we thought we'd throw dial up on here just for fun so we could all see where we've come from. Obviously, we're down in the kilobits per second um, speeds down there. You can't do anything today with dial up. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't that long. Many of us on the phone probably do recall dial up. It really wasn't that long ago. Which leads me to this slide, actually, which again, you know, we could do a whole history lesson. Um, you see the arrow at the bottom showing you the continuum of speeds. I'm not sure in 2005, even fiber to the premises was at one gigabits, maybe in some, you know, really dense core downtown areas. But again, the point of this slide is to show you how far we came just in these five years, right? Just in these five years from 1995 to 2005, there was a huge explosion of telecommunications technology advancement. And we really went from that kilobit per second to potentially a gigabit per second speeds. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully what this investment and federal investment in all of this um, infrastructure will bring another leap like this so that we can get more speeds, um, more technology to the end user and to residential consumers. So I'm going to stop here for a second. Um, that's my speed through of the um, high level technology. Um, Happy to take questions now or comments if there are any, or we can just wait until um, the end. So raise your hand, I guess, is probably, since there's just a few of us, feel free to, to raise your hand. Kaylin can unmute you, or I suppose maybe you can, I don't, I don't think you can unmute yourself. But if not, I'll just move on. I think it's fine. This was pretty straightforward. Um, 
so let's start with what is digital access. And, you know, I think that this slide really embodies the entire program that the Wyoming Business Council is looking at with $65 billion of federal funding in both digital connectivity and digital access programs. Um, about $42.5 billion in digital in a broadband in um, broadband infrastructure investment. And um, then less than 20, the math doesn't quite work out as there's other programs there, but I think it's about 16 billion in digital skills and access funding. Um, we are in the Wyoming Business Council. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what funding will be available. It's still, it's up in the air. Um, we don't know exactly, and we'll explain why that is in a moment, but whatever the, the ultimate funding is, the, the, the budget that we have will help these five pillars. Um, we've just talked about broadband access. Um, if, you know, obviously to have good digital access, you need broadband access. You need affordable, accessible, and reliable high speed, which is important, home internet service. And we need to make sure that everybody in Wyoming has that in order to make sure we can say everybody in Wyoming has digital access. The next thing we need is accessible and inclusive content. We need to make sure that there's a reason for people to go online, that people, this may be as easy, easy as educating people about what is online, or this may require additional funding to make sure that we're creating content or making sure the content is in language or we're making sure that content is accessible for those with disabilities. But you know, there's no use in making sure that people have a pipe that goes to their home if there's really no reason for them to get online. So that's accessible and inclusive content. We also have to make sure that once they've got a pipe and once they want to get online, that they're going to have a device that allows them to get online and that allows them to do what they need to do online. So the device has to be reliable. The, the device has to be pretty advanced. We have to make sure that the device has lots of uh, safety, uh, public safety communications features, um, that it can access the correct networks and all of those different things, whether it be mobile, tablet, um, computer, we need to make sure that um, people have devices and then they have the tech support both to learn how to use the device and then if something happens, it's not that it's going to get thrown in a drawer um, and not used, but that somebody will actually have access to a place where they can either learn how to fix their own or troubleshoot their problem or go somewhere to get it fixed. Um, next is privacy and security. We want to make sure that people feel comfortable online, that they know what kinds of information that they are potentially giving out, what kinds of information that they are um, telling people about themselves, maybe without knowing. Um, they want to make sure they can avoid scams, um, that they're not inviting viruses into their homes. So that privacy and cybersecurity piece is very important part of digital access. And then finally, digital literacy and skills. People just have to know how to get online. They have to know how to navigate things. I think that last digital literacy and skills is sort of a combination of how to use your device, how to make sure you're protecting your privacy, what's accessible content. Plus then for the workforce development piece, there's an important part of the digital literacy and skills element to this program, which is making sure people have the skills they need to get the jobs that are requiring uh, deep knowledge of digital skills. Um, as we know, more and more just simple warehouse jobs require you to certainly know how to use a computer and, and, and you know, program things um, in that job. And so, um, you know, being a cashier these days, right, you need, you know, the cash register is basically a computer. You need to really be able to understand how to do a lot of these things. And so digital skills and literacy also goes to that workforce development piece. All right. So what are we talking about here? Um, we're talking about the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, uh, the BEAD program. This is a federally funded program. Um, allocation came from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, and uh, the National Telecommunications Information Administration, NTIA, is the federal agency that is designated to administer these funds. Um, the funding helps states uh, connect unserved addresses and then un, uh, sorry, unserved addresses and then underserved addresses and then ensure community anchor institutions can get gigabit internet connection. There's a very important order of operations here that um, the BEAD program requires state recipients to do. And so a lot of this planning work that Wyoming is doing right now is to figure out how to do 
um, how to do this order of operations in the right way that works for the Wyoming residents. Um, as I mentioned, the funding does require states to prioritize fiber that's going to go direct to end users in that last mile application. And um, importantly, it requires uh, the, what's called a subgrantee, the companies that are most likely companies and organizations that are going to get this inve uh, infrastructure investment funding to make sure that the service offerings over that infrastructure will have at least uh, one or two low cost options, uh, uh, income eligible options for low income households. So that's part of the requirements for this program is affordability of that broadband service. Um, as I mentioned, the funding, the exact amount of funding is still a little unknown. Um, we need to do the five-year plan first. Um, well, actually, that's not true. We'll we'll have a better sense of how much money Wyoming is going to get before we complete our five-year plan. Again, you'll see in the timeline. But we do know that Wyoming is going to get at least $100 million. All states will get at least $100 million of broadband infrastructure funding plus then an additional allocation based on the number of unserved addresses. Um, and that is per the FCC broadband availability map, um, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Um, the broadband, the FCC broadband availability map is still a work in progress, although um, the map as of June is going to be, last we heard, the map that will determine that last allocation of funding to each state, depending on the unserved addresses. So this map comes up actually in a minute in an important way that you all can help uh, Wyoming with. Um, so, so how, so there's this money and we know we're going to get a hundred million dollars, you know, what do we need to do? Um, so actually I'm going to skip this bullet. We're going to go here. Actually, no. What, Here's what we need to do. We need to create a proposal. We need to create a proposal that is going to expend the funding that Wyoming gets for broadband infrastructure deployment in these four ways. Um, and they have to come up with a plan, which is the process we're in right now. Um, and as you can see by the bar down below with the arrow, this planning process will take us most of uh, 2023, although the actual five-year plan, as it's called, is due in August. And then there is an initial proposal plan that has to be done by the end of 2023. And so we're going to take this planning uh, process and make sure that we can identify unserved locations and we have a plan for how to fund enough broadband infrastructure to make sure that these people uh, will have service to their locations. We're then going to do a plan once we see how much we think that's going to cost and how we're going to do that and how long it's going to take to make sure that we have a plan to serve underserved locations, places that are getting more than 25, three megabits per service today, but less than 120. And then depending on the budget, depending on our priorities, depending on how the program's going, we are then, um, there will be a plan to connect community anchor institutions. They're in a slightly different spot because community anchor institutions are recognized in the federal uh, regulations and law as requiring a higher level of broadband connectivity to serve their mission, to do their job, and to serve the community. And so um, the FCC, uh, the uh, NTIA, and the federal law says if a community anchor institution is not receiving one gigabit symmetrical service today, uh, they should be eligible for funding once the state dedicates and allocates funding to the unserved and underserved locations, then we're encouraging states to make sure that those community anchor institutions have one gigabit per second symmetrical. The continuum down here below, you see the planning process goes out through 2023 and into the beginning of 2024. I should say that initial proposal will be due actually at the beginning of 2024. This is that provisional grant program. We're going to be working with NTIA to get approval of a, a, a provisional grant program through this initial proposal. And um, we will start working with ISPs and working with other stakeholders in the state to um, identify projects and start funding projects with the expected deployment and build out going through 2025, perhaps into 2026. So we've been talking about broadband connectivity, the top thing at this list as the top priority and making sure that we're connecting unserved and underserved. Um, there are other 
priorities that the federal regulations, the federal law um, encourage states to take on with this funding. They want you to make sure that your unserved and underserved are covered, but they also want to make sure that as you're covering those unserved and underserved, you're thinking about these different elements. And so as you design your grant program, you're thinking about these different elements, which we'll talk about in a minute. Notice workforce development is on this list. It's, it's a top of the list, actually, to some degree for the federal regulations to make sure that states are thinking about how to fund these infrastructure projects while also looking at ways that the same infrastructure project can tackle workforce development, can make sure that they're giving affordable services to specific covered populations like seniors and veterans, individuals with disabilities, to make sure that these specific broadband infrastructure projects can support programs uh, through community partnership with digital skills and digital navigators. So that's one element of these additional opportunities and priorities for this bead funding. There is another element, which is if looking at your budget for the program, if at the end of the day you have budget left over, you've taken care of your unserved, your underserved, um, they're being built out to, you maybe have your community anchor institutions um, set up with sufficient service. If there's budget left over, then, then programs that address these issues are eligible to be funded through this BEAD program but they're not first in line for the funding. And as we talk about the digital equity or digital access program, these um, issues come up again here, there as well. Um, we just talked about the five-year plan, the initial proposal and the final proposal. This is um, sort of the flow of what Wyoming Business Council will have to do with their bead funding. Um, and it's really that initial proposal that kicks off a lot of the actual grant making um, and grant funding of very specific programs. Right now we're in the five-year action plan process, and this is where we need your help and input to make sure that we have what we need to create that initial proposal. Um, I think we just went through a lot of this. As I mentioned, what the goal, the structure of this funding is that as states create these broadband grant programs, not only are they supposed to identify unserved and underserved and make sure the funding is going there, but uh, as part of those programs, they're supposed to make sure that grantees are paying attention to these issues like fair labor standards, like workforce development, like low income service options, and they're weaving these elements into the grant program and to their grant applications. So um, we're gonna switch gears now for a minute and talk about digital access or digital equity program. Um, the federal program is called the Digital Equity um, Act and the Digital Equity Program is the funding. Again, similarly, it is administered by the NTIA. It will um, provide funding to states to then um, distribute funding to different organizations within the state to address digital access, digital connectivity types of programs. Those five pillars that we talked about earlier, the accessible content, the devices, the privacy and cybersecurity, this funding will be um, also applied to those issues. Um, right now, just like BEAD, we're in a planning process. We have a digital equity or digital access plan that is due in October to the NTIA. Um, the NTIA is currently working on standing up its own digital equity capacity grant program that states will be eligible to receive funding for that program once their digital equity plan is in place. And um, there, again, the state will be setting up its own grant program to make sure that funding is distributed in a way that satisfies the federal rules. Um, there will also be a program that's a little farther down the road where um, any entity, any organization can go directly to the NTIA to apply for funding. So here's what the um, digital access, digital equity program is designed to address our gaps and needs in a state around things like broadband access, but not so much the infrastructure piece. This is more the affordability piece. This is the comfort um, and getting online. So that goes to devices and support, digital literacy and skills, accessible and inclusive content, privacy and security, the issues that we talked about earlier and why they're so important. The other element on this slide is the highlighting the 
emphasis in the prioritization that the federal um, regulations require on what the statute, the federal statute, calls covered populations. These are populations that tend to have a harder time online, have bigger barriers to accessing online content, to accessing online, may not have uh, the proper devices and certainly might not have the proper um, infrastructure or um, opportunity to get online. Um, you, you see these here, I think, you know, generally these are, there may be others, and that is something that the Wyoming Business Council and its planning process wants to identify is, is this the right list? Is this the only, uh, is this the only list? Um, should we add to this list? Um, and if we're looking at this list of veterans and seniors, obviously there's lots of crossover on this list. Of course, he, there may be one household that fits many of these um, covered populations, um, you know, what are the right programs to address these five pillars for these covered populations? Um, a little bit on timing here, state digital, so we talked about the fact that we're in the middle of our planning process right now. Um, the state digital equity capacity grant program, which is money going to the states, we expect to be stood up and states will start receiving money sometime in 2024, probably later in that, um, later in 2024. And then the digital equity competitive grant program is the one that I mentioned will be um, a direct, you know, individual schools and libraries and community groups can go directly to the NTIA to apply for funding. That probably won't be until 2025. I want to spend a moment here in part on the workforce um, specific piece to talk a little bit about what I think can be complicated, I, I think anyway, a little bit on what we're calling measurable objectives. And again, this is definitely part of the planning process, what we need input on from everybody. Um, Federal the federal regulations for both of these funding programs, BEAD and Digital Equity, want the state to create a set of measurable objectives. And ideally, the measurable objectives will be these six elements. Um, and measurable, obviously, objectives, you know, you break those up and, and they, they need to be concrete, they need to be attainable, we need to be taking all the input that we're getting during this planning process, identifying needs and gaps in the state, and creating these measurable objectives to make sure we're spending federal money properly as the next few years roll on. One of the elements of these measurable objectives is to make sure, is for, is for the broadband office and for this planning process to make sure that improvements in each of these elements of these measurable objectives will in turn help the state achieve broader policy goals. One of them is workforce development. The other is education, health, social, civic engagement, delivery of essential services. We definitely want to understand how improving access to affordable devices, making sure that broadband is affordable, making sure people know how to go online and use everything, making sure people are trained in the right digital skills to get a good job, how are those going to in turn impact us and, and hopefully benefit uh, the state's broader policy goals? That's a big part of this planning process. Um, here's another timeline where you can sort of see everything all together. You see this goes out for a couple of years. Even the, some of the arrows go out past 2025. We're expecting a lot of the building and infrastructure to go into 2026. Um, digital access and planning or in the planning stage right now that will go through 2023 and into early 2024 then we'll get the capacity grants and then the other grants so i think we've, we've talked about this a bit um if there's any questions we can take them all right uh let's do this and then we'll take another break for questions if anybody has anything or um comments so community engagement um this is the the process we're in right now as part of the larger planning process, it's very, very important um, to make sure that we're out and about in the community, understanding where the needs and the gaps and the creative solutions and the opportunities are um, to address a lot of the uh, measurable objectives and a lot of the issues that we talked about above. Um, right now, the block for April is colored for our statewide virtual facilitated sessions. That's what we've been doing. That's what this is. As you see, we've um, had several, um, targeting very specific types of stakeholder groups um, that these meetings are kicking off surveys and inventories that we're hoping each of the stakeholder groups will pull up and fill out. They're online. 
Um, those surveys will be done April, May, and June. We'll be open April, May, and June, and we'll be looking for people to fill them out and give us data and insight and suggestions through these um, surveys and inventories. During that same time frame, we're planning on going on the road and doing in-person meetings all around the state, um, relying on community centers and community colleges and other um, locations to um, host, and there'll be more information about those meetings coming up. And then for um, June, July into August, we'll be gathering all the data and doing the planning for both digital equity and broadband um, infrastructure investment. Um, uh, this is a, a pretty a complicated slide. I think the important part of this slide are the yellow are the green circles, uh, the green circles that show you sort of the role that each of the main stakeholders are going to play, we believe and we hope and we're urging to play residents and end users and how they can attend the regional meetings, they can give input to the organizations, um, community organizations that serve them. Um, we're hoping for Wyoming government stakeholders to play a very active role in identifying opportunities, identifying needs and gaps in their communities. Um, statewide, regional, and local ISPs and organizations, <clears throat> um, which is many of you, we're hoping to also play a, a big role in data gathering and giving us your input. And all of the broadband deployment and adoption diagnostic materials that we're doing, including research and these surveys, all will feed into the Wyoming BEAD uh, five-year plan, initial and final proposals, and the digital access plan. Um, so before I dive into the stakeholder groups, I guess I want to give um, anybody uh, questions if folks have um, suggestions as far as maybe measurable objectives that you want to talk about, if they're, especially this idea of the measurable objectives for this program feeding into larger statewide policy goals. Um, uh, perhaps you have some suggestions of uh, corners of the state or little nooks and crannies that we can make sure that we're doing our outreach to, um, we'd love to hear it. You can uh, type it in the chat if that's better or um, feel free to um, raise your hand and, and we can um, bring you in. So um, if not, we can, we can keep going. We've got some, I think, interesting workforce stuff to talk about here in a minute. <clears throat> okay. Um, Christine, there is actually a question in the chat um, from Devin. Okay. Um, Shell has recently been earmarked for development. Any other areas in the Bighorn Basin? Um, and that is one that um, on the geographic specific um, piece, I guess I would suggest if uh, David has a sense of that. Otherwise, um, I don't, I don't know right now. I get, well, one thing I will emphasize for this presentation and for the work we're doing right now is that um, we are in the planning process for a lot of this. And so for this federally funded program, we have not identified specific areas yet. Um, for I should say for this federally funded program and maybe for the others as well that Wyoming is looking at. Um, we've not identified specific areas. I will talk about the FCC map in a minute where you can go on and, and take a look, but I, I, I think you're familiar with that already. So I don't know if anybody else on the call has um, a comment. Yeah, Christine, this is David, and, and I'll just address a little bit of Devin's question. Uh, Devin, first of all, as we build these programs, there is a broadband map that Wyoming is developing on its own that is posted on the Wyoming Business Council's website. And I'll add that to the chat here in just a minute. So you can see uh, which areas are covered, um, which areas have received from some federal awards already. But as you continue to monitor that map, Devin, you'll be able to see where the grants uh, are going. Um, now, there are some ISPs that are doing private development on their own, obviously, and, you know, I know Jason Hendricks is on here. Jason, if you have anything to add to that, you certainly can. Um, and as far as the infrastructure goes, uh, a mix in, in all likelihood in the areas that are being developed. Um, you know, I know Cheryl has some aerial plant uh, that, that the provider up there can attach to the poles. But I think ideally uh, underground and then, you know, e there will even be some de further development of um, 
wireless infrastructure as well as we move through the program because as it stands today, you know, we just don't know that there will be enough funding to bring fiber to every home in Wyoming. So we'll be looking at some alternate technologies as well to, to deliver that um, additional broadband service. Great, thank you, David. Anything else? Um, I see we're actually, this is, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I do wanna get to the workforce development specifics um, material as well. So why don't we, um, I'll, I'll speed through these next couple of slides just to give you a sense of where we are. Um, I think we've talked about this. These are the stakeholder groups that we've been working with. You see workforce development is one of them, business and economic development as well, which I think a couple of you were um, interested in. Uh, we are having a specific meeting um, to out, reach out to those groups as well. And so each of these groups has their own unique uh, perspective and take, and we're working with um, each of these stakeholder groups to inform our planning and will continue to be working with each of these groups on an ongoing basis. Um, one of the ways we're working with these groups is to do um, inventory, is to do um, surveys and inventories. And so I want to talk about the workforce preparedness one specifically. Um, as you can see, we, we have several, we have six of them, um, and uh, they all sort of address a slightly different topic. Some uh, uh, of the stakeholders I just showed, including you all likely, would be best to fill out more than just one. We're hoping to get that good crossover and understand where organizations have something to say about multiple issues. Um, this slide actually, considering the audience, um, I may or may not be um, the most relevant, but what we are encouraging everybody, say we never miss an opportunity to talk about the ACP because it is such an important program. It goes straight to affordability. If you are working directly with families, if you're working directly with students and, and folks maybe who are doing workforce development projects, uh, their household may be eligible for this program. One way to help the Wyoming Business Council do its work and to do its planning is to make sure that um, all of your clients and constituents are aware of this program and, and the eligibility requirements and can sign up. Um, the link is there, uh, Affordable Connectivity Program. You just Google that. You're going to get a ton of information about what that means. We don't have to go into detail about the program itself. Um, I mentioned I was going to talk about the FCC broadband map. Um, uh, there is such a thing. The FCC has been working on this broadband map for a couple of years. They released it at the end of 2022. It um, is a service availability map. All of the ISPs in the country were required to submit data to the FCC for them to create this map. It's, um, I guess, controversial may be a strong word, but it is a work in progress. It is something that um, is open to challenge. And one reason why we wanted to bring it up today is because we wanted to encourage people who um, are working with households and working in the community to go onto the map. You can put a specific address in the map and it will show you what the FCC thinks is the service that's available in that area. And that is subject to challenge. Right there and then on the same um, webpage, you can then submit a challenge if you think the data is wrong. And so again, we don't miss an opportunity to encourage people who are knowledgeable and interested in the subject matter to go onto the FCC map, check it out, um, not only is this going to be important for Wyoming Business Council's planning purposes, but as I mentioned earlier, this is the map that will mostly primarily be linked to the how much funding Wyoming will receive for broadband infrastructure investment. So we want to make sure it's as close to accurate as it can be. All right. Um, so in our last uh, few minutes here, I'll take a, a look at workforce development. The links at the bottom of this screen, and they'll be in the chat as well, are links to the online surveys. Um, feel free to pull them up, um, take a look, um, and let us know what you think. Um, specifically on workforce development, uh, we'll talk about the elements of it in a minute. And then also we put another link in here on the programmatic inventory. Uh, if you are doing things broader around digital access and equity that don't just that doesn't just relate to workforce, you can pull up the programmatic inventory survey and tell us what you're doing and why you think you know the programs are relevant for the planning process that we're doing right now and, and how they can be helpful. 
So for workforce development specifically, as you all know, it's a very big tent. There's a lot of people involved in successful workforce development. Um, as I understand it, you know, we're we're getting started in the research um, for Wyoming on workforce development as well, but there's lots of very active programs happening right now in um, in um, Wyoming, including the Wyoming Innovation Partnership, as I understand it, is sort of the most recent um, uh, initiative that is a broad coalition of economic development, academic institutions. Um, it already has recognized the importance of digital infrastructure and technology as an area of focus. And so my understanding and our, you know, impression, and as the Wyoming Business Council knows, you know, that's just one in a long line of existing workforce development programs here in Wyoming. Um, and, and I'm sure all of these different programs involve all of these different stakeholders. And we're interested in hearing what all of these different stakeholders have to say around workforce development. Um, so what do we mean when we say workforce development in this context? Um, well, one thing we mean is that we have at least $100 million and likely, um, hopefully significantly more, um, to invest in broadband infrastructure in um, Wyoming. And in fact, that's just one program. There's other federal programs that are also coming online in Wyoming that will um, invest in additional broadband infrastructure. People need to be available to build that infrastructure. And so a big emphasis of the federal um, requirements is that the state um, not just give out this money, but that they give out this money to projects that are going to get built because the grantee has thought about workforce. The grantee has um, is doing things to make sure that they've got enough people to design uh, the program, to design the network, to, to work in the field, to do the construction projects, project manage those construction projects and do quality control and inspection, not to mention the ongoing maintenance and operation of the network. Um, Obviously, there's other bottlenecks that uh, these large infrastructure projects can uh, experience, excuse me, including, you know, not having access to the physical equipment and then just the distribution and logistics. But for today and for this online survey we're talking about, we really want to hear about different workforce opportunities to make sure that we're going to have the labor um, required in Wyoming to build these infrastructure projects. And we're going to have people uh, trained to be able to operate them and to be able to then get digital skills to take the good to take new and new job opportunities um, for uh, that require those deep knowledge of digital skills. Um, Wyoming, as part of its initial proposal and a little bit teeing up in its five-year plan, has to create a state workforce plan. They have to let the NTIA know how they're going to make sure that all of their grantees are in compliance with federal labor and employment laws, uh, fair labor practices. They have to demonstrate how they're going to make sure that there will be sufficient skilled workforce and what the activities will be around that skilled workforce what the training and workforce development activities are. So there's good jobs, um, good career paths, and then um, what labor contracting uh, practices, not just union, although union is obviously a big part of it, but not just union. That's sort of why it's asked in this way. Um, but what, you know, how are we going to work with the unions? How are we going to work with ISPs and different companies to make sure that we're doing a uh, good fair labor practices? And then last couple slides. Um, this one just sort of shows you different ways we can weave in workforce to different elements of the program. Um, I'm going to skip over that one so we can talk a little bit about, oh, and then sample activities that we think may come online that would be eligible for funding, certainly under digital equity programs, or at least as part of a specific infrastructure project that's getting funded to make sure that, um, that they can, um, to make sure that they can uh, support the their project and develop that workforce. Um, the workforce development survey itself is a mix of questions around understanding. Oh, I'm, I think I'm on automatic here. Apologize for that. Ah, okay, to understand um, the workforce development survey, to understand what programs are out there today, and importantly, what programs might be related but not directly today uh, addressing broadband network deployment. But maybe it's um, in the electricity field. Um, there was a news story, maybe I'm sure you all saw, of uh, I think it's Western Wyoming Community College 
that is taking the, you know, what was a workforce development program for oil and gas industry, turning it into a power line technology program, and maybe that's overstating it. Um, I'm sure the oil and gas industry programs may still exist, but they're using some of their resources to, to create this power line technology program because they're going to um, likely be getting a, a large nuclear power plant in the area. And, you know, they're learning how to climb poles, just like those uh, going to have to learn how to climb poles to build a broadband um, network. And so there's lots of crossover skills that we want to learn about um, through these surveys. We also want to understand what the barriers and obstacles are today to your constituents um, and accessing workforce development um, opportunities, particularly online. And, um, and then there are questions both in the workforce development survey specifically directed towards ISPs and what kinds of workforce development practices they have, um, including apprenticeships and internships, externships, um, working with the community colleges, working with economic development agencies to make sure that um, there is a good steady flow of workers. Um, and then I mentioned there's the other digital access program inventory survey. Uh, if you do have other programming that may be more related to digital access, to digital skills more broadly, not just workforce development, we would love to hear about that in this separate um, inventory, in this separate uh, online tool. So I think we still have, uh, we're kind of right at time. Um, if people have some time, I know it's late in the afternoon, we do, have, we do have a couple of discussion questions specifically about workforce. I'm very curious to hear what people have to say about what they believe will be the biggest challenges, what there may be some opportunities for workforce in the broadband space. Um, I don't know if folks wanna chime in, uh, maybe what even kinds of jobs and positions um, there might be that you that you already maybe are working on or that you're aware of. Um, we'd love to hear again, if not in the chat, then you know, um, you know maybe an email. All right, so I don't know, Tracy, Jason, Devin, if any of you have, especially, you know, Jason, for your, for um, the company, like if any of you have um, plans or, or at least can acknowledge that maybe this is, should be a high priority issue. It is something that, that you all are concerned about. That would be great to hear too. No. Okay. Well, I know it's late in the afternoon and I don't wanna keep you guys too much longer. Um, so let me put up the next slide here. And that's uh, you know something for you to keep, take a picture of, make sure that you uh, have the uh, website, have the email address. Um, if something comes to you later, feel free to let us know. Um, again, keep your eyes open for information about the in-person meetings. <clears throat> We'd love to see you. It will be different, slightly different content, I believe. Uh, we're still, you know, we're still working all those out. Um, and so, yeah, that would be great. If there's nothing else, then happy to say good afternoon and thanks everybody for joining. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Bye.